hey, Matt, would you like to thrive in any real estate market? Hmm. Well, I have seven strategies to share today to help anyone thrive in any market. And what do Frank Sinatra, the theme restaurant at LAX, and the Guardian Angel Cathedral off the Strip in Las Vegas have in common? Stay tuned for Wandering Zen to find out. Welcome to Wandering But Not Lost, your online source for finding balance so that you can align, connect, and prosper. I'm living right here and now and I don't want to miss out. Is this what life's all about? The world is calling and I'm listening. And now your hosts, Jen O'Brien and Matt Emerson. Well, you've reached the Wandering But Not Lost podcast where real estate and reality meet. It's episode 107. All of our show notes over at WBNLpodcast.com. Jen O'Brien, what's on the agenda today? As I mentioned, I have seven strategies that if you practice or implement or consider putting into practice today are going to help you thrive no matter what's happening in the real estate market. And Good. what the heck are you talking about? I didn't I, get that. Uh, I found a, uh, I was watching TV, found an architect that I had never heard of before. And his body of work is absolutely incredible. And I'm looking forward to sharing that. But before we go on anything, Jan O'Brien, what's been going on? I have some exciting, or not exciting, but uh, uh, some wandering stuff that I wanted to talk about. Last week, I went out by sweeping what? and I- What's what? in your hand, by the way? I oh, love that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Jen O'Brien. See, you bought me this for Christmas. It's my little squeeze groovy ball. And I yeah. actually, I should put it away now. No, but I like I, it. I, it's have been, I, I, use, I use it a lot. Okay, cool. Uh, anyways, so if you're watching, if you watch the video, you'll be able to see the stress ball, the groovy stress ball that Matt- uh, It is pretty that, groovy. That you have I guess take. Matt actually likes. I'm glad I you like that gift. It's cool. I love it very right. much. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we, Sweepy and I were going to go out and find some of the locations from the architect that I'm going to talk about today. Oh, cool. And uh, we went out last weekend and we went out in San Bernardino as one of his uh, masterpieces. Well, I'll give you that whole story later. But we got to thinking, while we're out here, let's go check out stuff on Route 66. So we went to the original site of the McDonald's and we went to um, the uh, Wigwam Motel. And we were just, then we just got to traveling down Route 66 all last uh, Saturday, which by the way, we'll be talking next week on on uh, Wandering Zen. We had some great, great photos. Like great, fo photos. great photos. And we just had such a good time. I mean, we had been to a lot of these places and you know, when you live anywhere in the West or anywhere along Route 66, you're on Route 66 a lot you just don't even know it half the time uh, but there's some neat things to look at but tomorrow for any of you Star Wars fans uh, uh, my sweet and I are gonna go to Disneyland Park and we are gonna get on or try our best ah. to get on the new rise of the resistance attraction this opened at Galaxy's Edge a few weeks back so it's like this big thing there's boarding groups to get on and usually by park opening plus five minutes all of the spots are taken for the whole day wow so we're getting our our ass es up tomorrow morning we're going to get to disneyland before it opens we're going to stand in line and we're going to be there with our app getting ready to see if we get a boarding group to get on rise of the Resistance. wow it's still that popular so apparently it's getting rave reviews i am telling you the things i have heard about that attraction are absolutely amazing talk about groundbreaking and just industry uh changing it is everything that i think they promised it would be from what i've been hearing from the reviews so looking forward to that and we just saw the freaking star wars movie last week so we're all still star wars up so Right on. Be careful for, or be ready for a review on that next week as well. All right, very good. Okay, cool. So we're ready to dive in and get some strategies to thrive and then learn about a cool architect. Right? That's right. Let's do it. You're listening to the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. Join us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and now on YouTube. It does. Okay. All right, everybody. Welcome. We're in episode 107 of the Wandering But Not Lost podcast. I'm going to cover seven strategies to thrive in any real estate market. And honestly, I have talked about probably all of these at one point or another. And I, I have, I used to have nine strategies actually. And so I revisited this post from a couple of years ago because it, it's timeless. It's going to stand the test of time even from when I talk about it today. But I want to did, cover these did, seven. Did you combine some of them or did you just say, yeah. this is out of date <laughs> strategy? No, no, yeah. 
Honestly, I re-looked at it and I said, yeah, I don't need to throw that in. That's just extra. Uh, because I'm taught, yeah, to be honest, there were that's two, a fl- tip. That's a tip, there were two fluffy, a there were two uh, fluffy ones in there. Got it. Uh, so number one is, in a lot of these are about mindset. So it's a little mixture of mindset and skill set. So number one is about taking personal responsibility. So I'm calling this understand that you are the creator of your reality. Okay. So what this says is if you always come from the place that you're not a victim. You're responsible for what's happening in your life, in your business. And I, and I really wanted to come back to this today because I feel like everybody is just so like all over the place right now and chaotic. I was talking to Matt about, you know, I don't know about you, Matt, but I feel like I, I can't believe it's almost March. I know. You know, and everyone is feeling so, you know, quick. Every time is moving fast. There's a lot of chaos. There's always chaos happening. And then there's people that are negative and complaining about, I don't have this and I don't have that. And and I can be that way sometimes. I don't know. Do I get that way sometimes? Maybe. No. No, not at all, right? Nope. <laughs> My sounding board says that I'm, I'm always positive. No stress here. <laughs> anyway, this is just a classic thing that, that we all, I think we all get this, but it's kind of cool to revisit and say, look, all your thoughts, all your actions, everything that I've done, you've done is, is, is gotten us exactly where we're at. So it's not about beating ourselves up and being negative about, oh, my God, you know, my situation is my responsibility and feeling bad about it. But it is about taking personal responsibility. So flipping the script on that is basically if you're not happy with what's going on in your business or your life, do something about it and change and start taking action. And I find always uh, when you just start taking an action forward, a small step towards what you want it's kind of amazing how things start to work out. So number one, you are the creator of your reality. Take responsibility for where you're at. And I've got three recommended books if you've not ever read them that I would highly recommend. And the first one is the classic Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz is another total uh, book I go back to and I I love. We actually did a podcast uh, uh, last year on the five agreements because there's there's four agreements, and I combine that four agreements book with Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, because I think that's the fifth agreement. So those are three classic books that I'm going to throw out to you that help you with your mindset. Let me throw another one out there. Oh, what's that? It's Angela Duckworth's Grit, The Power and Passion of Perseverance. Now, I haven't read this yet. This is on my wow. uh, my uh, reading list. Uh, Sweepy read this as part of a, uh, a class that she took uh, recently. She absolutely loved this book. So cool. I would recommend that as well. Matt, on a, on a nonfiction book recommendation? I haven't, actually, read, it. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> actually, thank, thank Laura Emerson for that one, okay? I will indeed. Uh, all right, so mindset, mindset, mindset. Get some help getting yourself back on being uh, uh, taking responsibility for where you're at in your life. Number two. Uh, boy, I have talk about this all the time. I started out the year with this doing great and I have allowed myself to get off track yet again. So I am recommitted to number two, adopt a daily practice mm-hmm. and to start your day and stick to it. And uh, I said I have a link to the to the it was episode 79 where I talk about daily success routine Um Recommendations here are The Morning Miracle, Love That by Hal Elrod. That's an awesome book. We have a link in the show notes for you on that one. Um, listen, so, so just to recap, if you've never heard about having a daily ritual, it's about getting up earlier in the day. Rolling When you roll out of bed, the f- first thing you d- don't do is to pick up your phone and read it. Okay, You carve out 30 minutes to an hour to go through your morning ritual. It could be anything from... Um, uh, walking, meditation, doing a gratitude practice, writing in a journal, uh, the miracle morning. I'll put a link to the show notes that we talked to uh, whatever podcast that was, where he, he calls it savers and it's scribing or writing affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading. Um, and, uh, actually the, I can't think what the last S is right now, but anyway, a daily routine. You don't have to do all of that. You got to pick, just do something that gets you in the right mindset and then go get ready uh, do your morning um, routine to take a shower, whatever it is you do, eat a breakfast and go do what you need to go do. So, And you know I what? Am, it, it is easy to get out of that routine. It's really oh weird because we've talked about it so much, Jan, over the years. And I know that you're really good about it and I try to do it as well. We have different 
ways we go about well, it. But you have an evening routine, though. Don't I, you? You I like do have an walk. evening. I have an evening walking routine, but I I do have a I do have a routine in the morning, and I have really gotten out of that. And I've been really working hard just this past week, this last you know the last four or five days to get back in that again. And I and honestly when you do, you are much more focused and you're, you're more productive. And I have felt that the last four days, it's really interesting. If, well, you, if you're feeling like you're out, you're feeling kind of out of it and go back to that. Cause that might change the whole picture. Well, it did for me. It, this is just horrible that I don't stick with this because this is what I've allowed myself to do. I get up really early in the morning. I go to sleep early and I get up early in the morning, but I have so much on my to-do list that I start doing the to-do list. Right. So now I, I feel like I've gone for about three weeks. I was doing this like clockwork in January and I've let myself for the last three weeks just say, I'm going to get up early and get caught up on my busy work. And then I find that I, because I don't do that piece where I kind of set my mind, you know, and I'm, I'm feeling like, gosh, I always feel better if I go do that. I'll do it tomorrow. And then I get up and get right into the routine of doing things. And it's got me out of sync. So yep. this is a reminder for myself talking about it on the podcast today. But honestly, it, it, uh, if you just go, go Google anything about this, everyone talks about it. Every successful, high right. performing person talks about having a daily routine, whatever that is for them. Number three, be open to change, adapt to the market. Now, I have always I actually wrote this post well, years ago when we had a short sale market in Las Vegas. And this is why I had some fun revisiting it, um, why I changed a few things in it. But basically, these seven strategies uh, apply to, to life in general, any business, actually. But I, I'm obviously talking about it in the real estate. And all this means is the market changes. The market is going to have cycles up and down. And it's about getting ahead of it. Uh, currently, right now, in our market and 20-something markets around the country, there's a lot of cash buyers, I buyers. We certainly talked about that a lot on the podcast. And that's a perfect example of understanding how to adjust and leverage that and put it to the, the fact is the fact. I just went to a presentation that there's predictions that this could happen in Vegas for another five years. So yeah. it is not going away. Cash buyers aren't going away. Uh, it's getting bigger and bigger. And you have to understand how to do it. So that's an example of adapting to change. And there's tons of people sitting on the sidelines going, yeah, that'll go away or I'm going to avoid it. So those that adapt and adapt quickly are going to thrive in any kind of business changes in any kind of business, specifically in real estate. So that's about maybe you have to go take a class. Maybe you have to go uh, like that's what I'm doing. I'm constantly educating myself so I can educate our agents on what's happening and here's some latest tools and so forth. So that's an easy one. Um, number four is good old fashioned polish your sales skills. Mm. You know, I think that we all, no matter how long we've been in the business, if you have part of your ongoing routine to go back and look at, I bet there's some area, if everybody was to just stop for a second and think, in my business, what area do I need to work on? Is it my listing presentation skill? Well, for example, right now, you, you certainly need to be adding to that the whole iBuyer craze and how you get in front of it. So that would be an example of brushing up on your sales skills. Are you good at closing people on the phone? Do you do online lead generation? If you're new, there's probably tons of stuff to practice here, but even the seasoned veterans need to get back to working on sales skills. So this whole idea, this whole strategy is all the time, what could you be working on? What area do you want to work on and get, get a brush up and enhance your skills? And so it could be once again, um, just practicing skill practice, uh, script practice, uh, taking class, doing some other things on that. So that's number four. Number five, uh, uh, unbelievable. Get back to the basics. Actually, I should call this never get away from the basics. Not, But I have to say get back to the basics because I, I talk to so many agents who are seasoned who do not have the basics in place. It, it's amazing to me. And they have been successful selling real estate and – they don't have classic systems in place in spite of which, themselves, which is, which right. is what, which is number six here. I'll talk about business systems just in a second, but here's what I mean by the basics. Do you have a CRM? Do you have a client relationship management tool, a website and a CRM that is the foundation of anybody's real estate business? You cannot do this business without a way to stay in touch with all of your leads and your contacts and let technology help you. So many people don't have this, Matt. It totally blows my mind. How many people were like, yeah, I, yeah, I know I need one. I just, the learning curve, the this, and then they're losing business. So 
it's it's everything from that. Do you have a solid? Uh, do you stay in touch with your database? That's another one. That is a basic basic fundamental deal. Do you stay in touch with the people that know you? Are you sending something of value? Do you do a local newsletter? These are all the things that we talk on the podcast all all the time. I'm not talking about tons of basics. I'm just thinking like, do you have a listing presentation? Do you have a CRM? Do you have a database? Right. Uh, do you have a, a buyer consultation? Do you have materials that make you look super professional when you work with buyers and sellers? That's what I mean by never get away from the basics. Number six is effective real estate business systems. And that's everything from a business plan, a no kidding, real business plan, uh, your unique value proposition. Do you know what that is? Do you have all your branding and promotional materials ready to go? Do you have a listing system, a buyer system? How do you follow up with leads? All of this can be helped with technology back to the CRM. Everything in one place can, can make this happen. And one of the frustrations I see with a lot of real estate agents is that they are frustrated over, I have five things I have to log into. I go over here for my CRM, then I go over here uh, to do this task of transaction management. But it is what it is. We are using all these these um, technologies and people avoid it. But I'm suggesting that if you do some research, this is why at our company, Home Connect, we, we are using the KV Core platform. Why? Because it's an all-in-one platform that has everything in it. And then we're helping people master that. And I, I taught a class yesterday for new agents and showed them one tool, one tool of many tools that we have, and it's the Home Search app. We have a great Home Search app that ties into the system. And I realized I had to change the way I'm teaching a few months ago because everyone is overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed anyway just because of the world. Now you take a brand new agent who's coming into the real estate business and we're throwing all these classes at them. And so we've regrouped at our company to focus on the basics to start with and then start to layer on it, layer on it, layer on it, and not overwhelm people. I've, I'm just so excited about this. And so I just did the, the class was on lead generation. And I took one tool that we have and I spent an hour and a half showing them all these cool ways to share that app. We practiced, they downloaded it, and how they can use that tool to generate leads on Facebook and all that. And it was amazing. Everybody was like, okay, I got it. Right. So that's what I'm talking about. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. It's just one system, you know, taking one piece of your system and putting that in place. You don't so, want to be the jack of all trades and master yep. of none. So social media marketing and all that. A uh, book recommendation for this tip is E-Myth Revisited. Mm. E-Myth Revisited, Michael Gerber, uh, really talks about systems and uh, probably even a shout out to the Keller Williams classic red book, the MREA, Millionaire Real Estate Agent. There's some uh, strategies in there around systems as well. All right, last one, number seven. Uh, so now that you have the mindset going, you're working on your business systems, you're back to the basics. You're polishing those sales skills. You're always open to change. And so all that has to do with uh, making sure you're staying on top of it will change year to year as, as the market cycles. So there's always stuff to work on on those six. Right. But I think the classic number seven is to, to create your success action plan, which means that you're super clear about what you need to do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to hit the goals that you set for yourself for, for your real estate business. So if you have a goal of closing two transactions a month, that's awesome to sit there and write a goal. I'm going to have two transactions a month, but what are you committed to doing consistently? And this is the thing I want to say to you, to you, don't try to do 20 things. Yeah. I'm always, always coaching three areas, your database always. That means sphere of influence, past clients. I call it database. And my, my, uh, my um, definition is if you pick up the phone and call someone on this list, they know who you are. There's strategies around that. For everyone. Then I say choose two other areas that you're going to focus on. And inside of these three things, so one is clearly your niche, what are you passionate about? We have tons of podcasts on that helping you figure that out. And then maybe it's one other thing. So it could be I'm going to be the king or queen of open houses or I'm going to kill it on online lead generation. I'm going to farm people who are 55 plus. You get it. What's your niche? But just choose Two to three, three is a good magic number. Now you're going to have strategies within those three things, which now become your success action plan. So for example, I did a podcast last year that was, what's the one thing that if you did every single day, like making five phone calls for me, five phone calls, that's my one thing. 
But then you have other strategies that you're, you're scheduling throughout your perfect week. Uh, and we have some examples in the show notes to help you with that and links to the other podcasts where we talk about really deep on those strategies. So I want to end with that one because I think when you're really clear, and this is where you can get less overwhelmed. And I'm saying this for myself, okay, because I sometimes do these podcasts because I need to practice what I preach. Right, Matt Emerson? So I have like three I use these kind of things for my checklist, right? I'm, I'm holding up some notepads. Uh, I have them, I went and got colored different ones because I have so many pillars of things that I'm working on for our company, you know, for uh, areas within the company for recruiting and working with agents and coaching people in this podcast. There's endless things to do always. And guess what? There's going to always be endless things to do. So I have to get back to this number seven I'm talking about right now, which is knock out the three or four things that I know I need to do every single day. And that's going to make the goals for myself, our business move forward. Then I'll get to all the other things that are on the list. So you got to handle the, uh, as Brian Tracy would say, eat that frog. It's great. Another great book, by the way, I'll put that on the list. It's a very short, simple book to read, but in essence, if you don't want to read it, he's basically saying, Take care of the things that you really don't want to take care of, like your prospecting calls and your follow-up calls and uh, those type of things. Don't save those for last. Do them first. Do them in the morning, and your business will move forward. Um, How do you feel? Much more relaxed. <laughs> it's you know, it's a, this was a this was a very good um, wandering, for me. wandering but not lost therapy session. All right, very good. Well, for Jan O'Brien, it was. So I hope. Oh, I hope. I hope uh, you're listening that you got something out of that because I certainly needed it today. <laughs> Good stuff, Jan O'Brien. All right. Come take my hand and see the world around you. The time is right. Just let the lights surround you. And step by step, you feel it coming alive. The feeling deep down inside. The best memories are made when you take the road less traveled. Visit wanderingbutnotlost.com for some inspiration. In today's Wanderings In, we explore the work of the inspirational architect, Paul Revere Williams. His moniker of architect to the stars uh, was well, well deserved, but his other creations helped, um, helped form the feeling and vision of his time. And uh, oh, by the way, uh, he was African-American. And one of the first African-American um, uh, architects that really got major prominence uh, in the United States uh, and uh, was a part of the American Institute of Architects. Very interesting. He had a lot of, uh, of uh, things to overcome, a lot of things to, uh, to break uh, barriers on uh, because he was uh, African-American in architecture, which was really just a white man's world. Uh, he and, um, uh, oh, what was her name from Hearst Castle, Morgan? Uh, oh, my goodness. I think her last name was Morgan, uh, who was the first woman in California to become an architect, uh, kind of did their thing all around the same time in the early, uh, you know, well, early 19th, uh, 20th century, I guess that's what it is. I always get that uh, backwards. Me too, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about him today. Interesting, you know, we're going to talk about things and sites that you will know. Uh, but I didn't know that he was the one that either designed them or redesigned them or renovated cool. them. Melinda. Yeah, it actually is pretty, pretty interesting. I, you know, we were talking about our routine, morning routine. Something I never, ever do in the morning or very infrequently do in the morning is turn the TV on. And a few weeks ago, I happened to turn the TV on and I was kind of, I was having my coffee and yogurt and I was cruising by, you know, my normal routine, PBS, Smithsonian, Travel Channel, you know, all of that, kind of looking for things to wander or places to wander. And there was a documentary on this guy. And it was a, a it, it, what caught my eye were these old classic, beautiful homes in uh, like, I would assume Beverly Hills. Oh, and, and it turned out to be a lot of them were in Beverly Hills uh, that were back in the forties and fifties and sixties. And um, I, I started watching, I, I, I got it right towards the beginning. It was an hour show. I ended up watching the whole hour. It was fascinating to me 
the work that this guy has done. So we're going to talk about Paul Revere Williams today on Wandering Zen. Go over to the show notes over WBNLpodcast.com. I have information about him, a ton of links to specific projects that he did, as well as a short like 26 minute video that I found from a PBS. Well, I don't believe it was the same documentary, but gives you a little background on this guy because he really had a fascinating uh, life. And uh, you'll you'll learn a lot about him over there. WBNLpodcast.com or wanderingbutnotlost.com. Paul Revere was a native Angelino. He was born in 1894 and his parents uh, died when he was very young. So he was orphaned at age four. Now he uh, he had one brother, his brother and he were actually split up into separate uh, homes. He was very, very fortunate. The home that he was placed into, the mother in particular was very into the arts, very into education. And he grew up with that as a really a staple in his life. And it really guided him and formed what he wanted to do uh, with his future, knowing full well back in that time that, you know, because he was an African-American, he was going to have challenges along the way. As a matter of fact, when he was in school, he had written papers and he was talking about wanting to becoming an architect and his teacher or teachers probably would always tell him that's something he couldn't do or shouldn't do, or, wow. or would, wouldn't be successful in. Well, you know, I, I love this guy's uh, stick to because he's like, you know what, that's not gonna work for me. That's what I wanna do. And his he had backing of his his parents or his foster, or his, um, you know, his his, his, his new, his new uh, family. Parents. Yeah, and uh, really uh, the things that he was able to accomplish in his lifetime during the age that he accomplished it were nothing really to me short of amazing. Uh, he landed internship and in inter- internship or internships right out of high school, took classes at the Los Angeles Bow Art School, which is a famous architecture and design school, and attended USC's School of Engineering. So dude was on a, a track, right? He knew what he wanted to do and that's all there was to it. Um, he, he because he knew there were racial challenges that, that if people knew that he was an African American that he would have a harder time or not be looked at uh, when submitting designs at the top of the list probably so at the time and they still do this a lot now there were, were a lot of architectural contests where they would throw out a contest and a lot of different firms would come in and submit their designs early on in his career he uh, entered a lot of these contests and you know, there's no one, there's no race to that. There's just your name and the designs that you actually submit. And he won a lot of those contests. Wow. And he was uh, he was able to gain notoriety and some that recognition way. because of that. Yeah. And, you know, because, you know, what are you going to do? We love what the guy does, but we're not going to, you know, we're not going to go down the, the path you know, for racial reasons. Now, no doubt that happened to him, you know, throughout his career, probably a lot. But over the span of his uh, career, he designed over 3000 different designs, houses, tracks of homes, public spaces, public buildings. And just like I said, architecture that we're going to talk about that you're going to, you're going to know and you're going to recognize uh, to a a lot of them were really to my amazement. So 3000 total and over 2000 just in the Los Angeles area. Oh, wow. Wow. Prolific um, uh, work that this guy did. And because he was very well-spoken and was able to really um, handle himself among the powerful and rich and the Hollywood elite, he was able to really get into some of the inner social circles of Hollywood at the time, uh, which I think is just, once again, it's just fascinating considering his background and you know what he was able to build. So talk about a positive mindset or growth mindset. This guy, I mean, he had it had it going on, right? So one of the first projects that he worked on, there was a a senator in California at the time, his name was Flint. I think it was Frank Flint was his name. And who, I don't know if if you're familiar with uh, the area outside of Pasadena, but there's an area outside of Pasadena that's called Flint Ridge. And, you know, back in those days, LA was nothing. There was nothing going on. Well, Flint decided he was going to build attractive homes out there for the, you know, more of the elite type of clientele and it ended up being called Flint Ridge. Well, Uh, Paul Williams was brought in to help design a lot of the homes in Flint Ridge. So I can't wait till the next time up in Pasadena to get in there and really kind of, because there are some of them that have been identified as his designs Mm -hmm. and get in there and really see some of the homes that he designed that are still in that area. And that kind of thing went on and on. He would do a lot of work with producers and directors and, and movie stars along the way. And that's how he got his moniker of being architect to the stars. He worked with 
you know, Frank Sinatra, Lucy, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, uh, Lon Chaney Jr., uh, Johnny Weissmuller, uh, uh, what was another one that was, oh, Burt Lahr. And the list kind of went on and on and on from, from there. But he, you know, he got in with the group, they shared um, their experiences uh, with their friends, and he did a ton of homes in, in Beverly Hills and Bel Air and all just throughout the Hollywood Hills. Is there's Paul Williams architecture all over the place? Oh, what time period? Like it, really kind, of, it kind of goes. Uh, you know, I mean, he really got out of school like in the in the twenties, but he was designing all the way up until he retired in 1973. So oh my he God. Did a lot, a lot of work, including his own home, which I need to get up and see. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Uh, where he designed. Now, the thing that's unique about him, a lot of people, a lot of architectures have a, a particular design style that they mm -hmm. uh, that they design around. He had a, a really unique knack for being able to really sit down with a client, find out what they were really looking for, and then design the home around their needs, providing them the dream that they were really looking to achieve in their home, which, you know, sounds like something that every architecture uh, tech, uh, architect would do. However, I think a lot of people choose an architect to the design style that they actually represent. Yeah, he, kind of did it, he kind of did it the other way around and was hugely successful because of it, because it would exceed the expectations of the clients every time. And that's why, he, I mean, talk about referrals. So this guy had referral business left and right because he was, because no two houses that he designed were the same. It's it's really fascinating when you really go in. I've I've done a lot of research on this guy, and I just I can't believe I've never heard of him before. Shame on me. Um, I'm excited uh, that I have discovered him because he's done done so much. Um, one technique that he learned to do. Once again, this gets back. I hate to keep bringing the racial thing back into it, but you know, for crying out loud, we have racial inequality today. So imagine what it was like back when before things were as you know progressive as they are right now he learned to draw upside down so when he was with clients because a lot oh, wow. of people would be very uncomfortable sitting next to an african-american gentleman he learned to draw upside down so he could sit across the table from his clients and sketch what the designs wow. were going to look like and uh, uh, the 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 documentary that i um watched actually showed him well i don't know if it was him or not but showed that the art of doing that upside down and can you imagine doing that i mean it was it's really an amazing technique but it worked very very well for him he kind of got to be known for that that he was like the upside down uh uh engineer so cool. it, interesting stuff he did a lot of other you know, public work kind of buildings he did the courthouse in los angeles he designed um that first aid a a E M or A M E church here in Los Angeles. Uh, he was a part of the panel that designed Los Angeles International Airport and was a very uh, dis, um, involved in the design work of that themed restaurant, which is that classic kind of spaceship looking thing at LAX. You see it in it's oh, iconic. Yeah. You see yeah. it in movies all over the place. A um, couple restaurants in Los Angeles, uh, Chasen's Restaurant in uh, West Hollywood, which was the hot spot for a Hollywood elite. Uh, and uh, Perino's Restaurant, which is down at Wolster Boulevard. Those are both unfortunately gone now, but he designed those restaurants. Interesting fact that I, once again, need to go out and wander. Chasen's Restaurant was, was torn down, I believe, in the 90s, maybe even been in the 2000s. And there's a Bristol Farms there now. But the cool thing is, inside Bristol Farms, you know how Bristol Farms always has a little cafe they saved part of the booths and the original restaurant inside that bristol farms that cool. is his original design of chasing so cool stuff there he was responsible for a lot of um renovations of really classic major hotels the beverly hills hotel in uh beverly hills you know that classic kind of uh, uh art Andrew. deco we yeah. yeah uh with that classic beverly hills hotel script which actually is his handwriting uh that made up the signage for that hotel yeah. cool thing right uh he didn't uh, design the hotel but he came in during a renovation he was really responsible for a lot of the, touches the pattern that's there now that's classically known for its floral kind of banana leaf uh style, which has remained all the way to today. He designed some of the bungalows. And as a matter of fact, I'm not sure what year this actually happened, but one of the bungalows was renamed the Paul Revere Williams suite, uh, which is one of the most popular suites in the hotel today. He did the Beverly, a renovation of the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. 
the Ambassador Hotel, which, you know, was iconic uh, hotel for a lot of reasons. The Coconut Grove was there, which he was responsible for helping to, uh, to do a redesign on. You know, that is the hotel that uh, RFK was actually assassinated in. Uh, that hotel is no longer uh, there either. As a matter of fact, a lot of Paul's uh, work has been uh, destroyed over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a big movement right now to preserve a lot of the buildings and get historical landmark uh, status to the buildings that he actually did create right now in Hollywood. Uh, so immediately Amazing stuff around the Los Angeles area. And I think like, you might enjoy this a little bit, Jan O'Brien. He did design the uh, cathedral there right off of Desert Inn near the Wynn Hotel. The uh, the uh, cathedral there in Las Vegas still stands today. That's a Paul uh, Williams uh, design. Wait, and where, he, where, where? It's right, right off of Desert, Desert Inn Boulevard oh. next to the Wynn. I, I don't know, know that. Yeah, he, know he, it. he designed that church. He oh, also cool. um, designed the uh, La Concha Motel. Have you ever uh, heard of that? Yeah. I it's think that it's, one with, it's that design that had the classic really kind of googie almost arches and stuff. Do you know, of course, that is no longer in its original yeah. location, but you know where they moved that lobby? No. You're, you're going to know this no. and you're going to blow your mind. No. It is now the entrance and kind of the gift shop to the Neon Muse neon Light Museum. No, there well, in I, Vegas. Think that's, I think that sign is in the Neon Museum. Yeah. So it's sign from that hotel. Yeah. And the actual where you walk in uh, there is the, oh. uh, is the building that he designed. They, they moved it. So... That's, that's on my list. I mean, yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm going to go there this Yeah, weekend. well, we've been talking about that. So <laughs> anyway, so that's it's something else to go there when you look at, go to the Neon Museum. It's not just the Neon. It's also right. a hand building. Um, right. And he did, he did a lot of designs for things that never actually came to fruition. He did some of the design work for the Pearl Harbor uh, Memorial in, um, Hawaii. in Hawaii. And he also did this really groovy... Uh, design for a monorail system in Las Vegas back in the 1960s. It was called Skylift Magicab. And uh, <laughs> it's, it is the coolest thing. You can see pictures of it over on the website. Uh, it didn't come to fruition because back in the 60s in Vegas, even though they knew that it was a growing community, they just didn't feel like the money it would take to build the monorail was going to be worth uh, what happened. Now, you know, today with the way the growth has been in Las Vegas, they have monorails all over the place to Absolutely. whisk people back and forth. So, you know, way ahead of the time, he's done uh, a lot of work in Las Vegas. As a matter of fact, there's a couple housing tracks that he did in Las Vegas where he designed for more low income uh, 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 housing there. He did an original racetrack that used to be in Las Vegas. So he did a lot of design work outside of that. And another thing that he was is very well known for, uh, he got to know Danny Thomas over the years. And Danny Thomas asked him to design the initial buildings of the St. Jude Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. So uh, once again, pictures over in the show notes, but he had a classic kind of uh, very modern kind of hub and spoke kind of design to that hospital. And he and Danny Thomas became uh, very close over the years. Uh, he passed away in 1980. And uh, his funeral was held and service was held right in the Amy Church here in Los Angeles that he designed. And um, uh, Danny Thomas actually gave uh, one of the eulogies wow. at his, his funeral. It was, uh, I hate to say stars, star set at event, but I mean, it was, a, it was a big deal. And he was really paid homage uh, at his service at the Amy Church. He had to be, what, 86 or so? Did he, you say well, 80, a little 94? more than 80. Yeah, yeah, 80, 80, yeah. No, no, no longer. No, that, yeah. Yeah, right about yeah. that. So, anyway. but but what a career from this guy! And like I said, you know, people that are listening might know who this person is. He was new to me, but very familiar with his work, and it was exciting to uh, find that. So, I hope hope you got some insights uh, into cool. one of the architects that it really formed a lot of what Hollywood looks like today. Go over to our show notes over wbnopodcast.com. Check out the links that I have there. Watch the video, and uh, remember, everyone, you know. I, you can do whatever the hell you want to do, right? Sometimes you need to do a little wandering to get to that point, and uh, but you can do it. So um, get out there, get up, and get out, and make it happen. I think that's the key. Just do it. That's right. You're listening to the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. Join us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and now on YouTube. Well, that's a wrap for another Wandering But Not Lost podcast. This was episode 107. All of our shows uh, over at WBNLpodcast.com. Jan O'Brien, after your session today, I'm feeling much more relaxed. I have uh, kind of prioritized my duties. I am back into my morning routine and um, ready to, to hit everything and get all my cylinders running. It's all good. 
Yes, and the one thing I will share that I think is powerful to, even if you just picked one thing on that morning routine, it's it's taking five or 10 minutes of, of reading and then maybe writing down a gratitude. I'm back doing that this morning. I actually listen to uh, something I'm gonna do in the next two episodes, Matt, is I went back to something I did in 2017 on practices and tools for well-being. And I have uh, 16 tools and strategies, tactics, whatever you want to call them, that we'll do over two parts that will be all about your well-being. I love it. Right? Yep. And Gratitude Journal is definitely one of those. Yeah, I, right. I have in this last few days have gotten where I've gotten up. I have my coffee, I get my yogurt, and I sit, we have a nice little uh, breakfast nook in our place that the sun comes in and it's just a nice place to sit and just sit there and eat my yogurt. No sound, not looking at anything. You know, the cats will come up and do their thing. It's really, and and, and doing what you're talking about, not physically writing in a journal because I'm not a journaler, but doing that same practice, right? Thinking about mm-hmm. the day before, thinking about what I need to do today, thinking mm-hmm. about the good things that in my life right now or thinking of the challenge that I need to over. I mean, it's been really, it's it's a uh, form of meditation that has actually worked really, really well. There you go. Week, so. And then, you, and then oh, you finish your day, so kudos to you. Uh, you. You do that and then you finish your day, you generally go out on a walk, which is definitely where you unwind and maybe listen to a podcast and you have time to center and then maybe have a good night's sleep and start the day again. That's really what we're talking about. Absolutely. So you do your your way. I have just been off the kilter and I getting myself back on it is what's going to help me be even better. And that's what I know when I do do this uh, and follow some of these other ideas that we talked about today, then um, everything works better. You know, things work out better in life. You're, you're showing up better for people in your life and you're not feeling so stressed out and you're rested and all that good stuff. So we'll talk yeah. more about well-being tools in the next two uh, episodes. You need to find your path, right? You're going to find, need to find, a, find the path that works for you. And speaking of that, go over to the WBNL shop. You can find really great Find Your Path merchandise over there. So a little Absolutely. plug there. We'll put that link in the show notes as well. All right. Everybody have a great, awesome rest of your day and week. And we'll see you on our next podcast. And be forever wandering, but not lost.